two o'clock. My name is Rob Altamont, and I'll be your moderator for today's Harika webinar titled The Basics of Feral Installation. The webinar will be led by Harika's Technical Director, Jeff Summon. Let me give you a few words on Jeff's background. Jeff has worked in all facets of club making and repair since 1984 and has devoted the past 20 years to researching, testing, and analyzing thousands of different golf shafts. He has compiled his findings and research into the Dynamic Shaft Fitting Index, which is featured in the best-selling book, The Modern Guide to Club Making, and Total Club Fitting in the 21st Century. Additionally, he has authored the annual Dynamic Shaft Fitting Addendum, which instructs club fitters in the proper fitting and selection of shafts. Both books are available for sale online at hericogolf.com. Let me get a few housekeeping items out of the way first. Your audio settings are muted, which means we cannot hear you. And if you have any questions, use the question box located in the upper right-hand corner of your dashboard. If for any reason you must leave the webinar, don't worry. It is being recorded and will be on youtube.com slash hericogolf and on our blog in about one hour. The address for the YouTube and our blog is on the uh, very last page of the slide, which Jeff will show in about 40 minutes. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Harico Golf's Technical Director, Jeff Summit. Take it away, Jeff. Thank you, Rob, and thank everybody for attending this webinar. Our topic today is regarding ferrules in general and on to ferrule installation. I want to first go over what the purpose of the ferrule is, the, the anatomy, and the different styles you may encounter in club making and repair. Ferrules are those plastic trim pieces located just above the hosel on the club head. Their main purpose is to provide a nice smooth transition from the hosel to the shaft, which provides a professional appearance. Now, the vast majority of the ferrules you see are black in color. However, ferrules can add a cosmetic element to just about any golf club. Certain models may have one or more color trim rings on the upper or even lower end to match the paint scheme of the head the shaft, or even the grip. Not every club will require a ferrule, although most do today. If the club's hosel has a rounded edge, like most plumber neck uh, putters do, then the club head's not going to require the use of a ferrule. However, if the top of the hosel is flat with a square top edge shape, the club has been designed to be assembled with a ferrule. Ferrules are designed to be undersized in relationship to their interior diameter. For instance, a ferrule designed for a 370 parallel tip shaft will actually be intentionally manufactured with a, uh, a, a 368 inside diameter. This requires uh, force fitting the ferrule onto the shaft in order to reduce the likelihood the ferrule could slide up and down the shaft at a later date. It's one of the reasons uh, those new to club making find this procedure tedious because they just assume that the ferrule should slide easily onto the shaft tip. For years, the outside diameter of the ferrule was typically made larger than the average hosel. This required that the club maker turn down or sand the ferrule flush with the outside diameter of the hosel to provide that nice smooth transition. Many club makers find turning ferrules takes up valuable time or they simply don't have the right equipment to do so. To eliminate the need for sanding the ferrules, it's useful to have the appropriate size one. In the case where the ferrule is undersized or the base or the bottom part of the ferrule is smaller than the outside diameter of the hosel, this shows poor workmanship. The best scenario is to find a ferrule that fits almost precisely but errs on the larger side. As a club maker, you have to realize there are tolerances. And there's no such thing as a perfect fit. For starters, the outside diameter of the hosel, uh, those are hand polished during the finishing process and will not match outside diameter for outside diameter each and every time. This is the reason why turning down the ferrule is the most acceptable method. At Harico, we've actually made your work easier providing different size wood ferrules. Plus, we've standardized the hosel diameters with respect to our product category. That is, all our irons, uh, hybrids, and, and wedge hosels are designed with a 13.6 millimeter or 0 .0 or 0.535 inch outside diameter. On our stainless steel wood ferrules, the diameters are 12.2 millimeters or 0 0.48 inches. And lastly, on our titanium drivers, 
the diameters are 12.7 millimeters or half an inch in diameter. This is why we offer two different size wood uh, ferrules. Otherwise, it's going to require you to remove 20 thousandths from the base of the ferrule just to match the stainless steel uh, fairways. The only exceptions are going to be our tour gear irons, which are die cast zinc and require a much larger hosel diameter um, for, for strength purposes. In that case, we have a specific ferrule available for that iron. Plus, that ferrule works well on some of those older style irons uh, that you may have to reshaft that have the, the large hosel ODs. One other example is our Dynacraft Profit ICT fairway woods. They use the same ICT adapter sleeve, which is used in the drivers. So you would elect to use the ferrule design for the titanium drivers. This is why it's always helpful to be able to measure the outside diameter of the hosel accurately with your calipers, especially with a club or a brand you may not be familiar with. We'll talk about those adapter sleeves a little later, too. When selecting uh, which ferrules to use, the requirements not only to choose the type that is designed to fit the uh, diameter of the shaft you're, you, you'll be using, but uh, uh, to suit the design of the club head as well. I should probably elaborate here. It's customary to select the length of the ferrule based on the length of the hosel. For example, a short ferrule looks more appropriate on a shorter hosel, while a longer ferrule is better suited to a more traditional long hosel club. So let's go over each of the different types of ferrules that you may encounter. Typically, an iron ferrule which can also be used for hybrids and wedges, will range in height from an eighth to um, an inch and a quarter tall, with shorter ferrules being more popular today. As mentioned before, the inside diameter is 2,000 smaller than the typical 370 shaft. This allows for some tolerances when abrading the shaft, so the likelihood that there's going to be a force fit to prevent the uh, ferrule from sliding up and down the shaft. Iron ferrules are also available to fit both taper and parallel tip shafts, but I find you don't really need specific taper tip ferrules. Since a taper tip iron becomes larger in diameter as we move up the shaft, by the time it's pushed up um, above the hosel of a standard 370 iron, or well, a, a, a hosel of a 370 iron ferrule fits pretty tight, at least if you select ferrules that are at least 5 eighths of an inch long. At this point, the length of the, the shaft below the ferrule is 1 inch and will be less than the insertion depth of most irons, um, wedges, and hybrids. If you use a shorter ferrule, then it's going to slide too far up above the position where the top of the hosel will be when the shaft's fully installed. Now, metal wood ferrules are narrower diameter versions than their iron counterparts, typically ranging in length from an eighth to three quarters inch long. Metal wood ferrules are available in 335 inside diameters, and some are available to fit 350 shaft tips. Most metal wood ferrules are designed to fit titanium drivers and then sanded to fit flush to the smaller diameter stainless steel wood hosels. If you don't sand or turn down the wood ferrule on a fairway wood, then you'll get a lip that can be felt by running your fingers over the uh, juncture where the ferrule and the hosel meet. Even though it may only be 10 thousandths of an inch per side, it does, again, show poor workmanship. Perico offers matching ferrules to more pre precisely fit flush with both types of heads. In another webinar, We'll tell you how to uh, turn those ferrules down, too. Now, collared ferrules feature a, a tapered uh, lip or a flange below the base or the bottom that, that's designed to fit down inside this, the countersink or the beveled area in the top of the club's hosel. Now, the theory behind collared ferrules is that they'll help reduce stress on graphite shaft installations. Well, the fact is, if the hosel is properly countersunk, 
any type of standard uh, metal wood or iron ferrule is perfectly acceptable. If you elect to use collared ferrules, expect to do some additional countersinking to the heads. You see the ferrules are precision pieces, but the countersinking done by the foundries is not. So don't expect the lip to fit and have the, the, the ferrule seat flush with the uh, hosel each and every time. And for this reason, I'm not an advocate of using them in any of my assemblies because it requires extra work with really no additional benefit. Now, counterboard ferrules are slightly different from a collared ferrule. Instead of a 20 degree angle that's produced uh, from standard countersinking to reduce stress at the top of the hosel, some manufacturers elect to create a recess section for the first quarter inch or so of the inside diameter of the hosel. Now, a special ferrule with a pronounced lip or step will seat down inside this recess section of the hosel to eliminate the stress at the top of the hosel. I didn't show a picture here, but the counterboard ferrule's lip runs parallel to the walls of the hosel while the, uh, the collared ferrule is angled. It's a way to tell the difference. This used to be quite common to see junior components offered this way using the combination counterboard hosel and the ferrule. And if you do a lot of repair, um, you're going to see a few of the ProLine OEM clubs, such as Callaway, TaylorMade, and Titleist, utilize this type of ferrule. Reducer ferrules are relatively new in the last decade to coincide with the decision that some of the name brand manufacturers have done to make their club heads with larger hosel diameters. They're designed to serve double duty. That is, they act as a normal ferrule, but they also have an extended lip that fits down inside the hosel to reduce the uh, diameter. The objective is to be able to use standard size shafts into the head of a club with an oversized hosel diameter. They're used exclusively for repair when reshafting a club and not for new club assembly. And, there are, and these are also referred to bushing ferrules. Now, replacement adapter ferrules are specific type ferrules used in repair and reshafting of many ProLine OEM models. Some of those ferrules will be exclusive to one make and model, such as a Ping G2 fairway wood or a Ping TISI driver. Other, other models might fit, uh, fit a particular brand, such as a model for Callaway that fits many different models within their line. Some of these specialty ferrules available by the component suppliers like Carrico will offer these to accept 335 shafts rather than the 350 shaft that originally was offered with the OEM model. Therefore, they can be considered reducer ferrules as well. But if you do a lot of repair, I'd suggest having a couple of each of these things on hand. For one, they're inexpensive and your customer won't have to wait a long period of time for you to order that piece and have it shipped to you. Also, some of these types of heads I mentioned are fairly old, and especially feral, ferals may be hard to find, if not impossible. At some point in time, you may be the only person in your local area that's going to be able to repair those clubs correctly. The last two ferals aren't sold anymore. Uh, but you may experience them uh, if you ever uh, work with wooden woods or need to re-whip one. So this is why I at least want to give a mention so you'll know what they are. Once available in a variety of sizes to fit the different shaft tip diameters that were used, ferrules for wooden woods are intended to provide a smooth transition for the string whipping um, uh, to go along. You guys are lucky today. Wooden wood ferrules required the club maker to file or sand the ferrule down in diameter along the entire length to, to provide that nice smooth or taper over which the whipping would be wrapped. And if you didn't do it correctly, the imperfections would show up immediately, yeah. um, and this would require you to start all over again. This required a lot of work to make sure that there was not a step closest to the, uh, the shaft end of the ferrule. 
the club maker actually had to feather it in. It's almost a shame that some of you out there won't get an opportunity to see just how much skill it required to do it right. Now the shanked wood ferrule was like a bicycle with training wheels. Its purpose was similar to the regular conventional wood uh, ferrule, which was to provide a foundation for the string whipping. The difference was the shank ferrule had a small ledge molded at the top end of the ferrule to provide a uh, starting point for whipping. Because of this small ledge, all the filing or sanding on the shank ferrules would be performed along the bottom or the large end of the ferrule. The, the shank actually allowed the first few wraps of whipping to be installed because it provided a place where it would rest against, and this was favored by uh, beginning club makers. Now that we've explained what a ferrule is, and most of the different types, let's move on to how to install them on the shaft. There's different methods of installing ferrules depending on who taught you. So instead of teaching the hard way, I'm going to show you my preferred method, which utilizes a uh, ferrule installation tool. There's four basic steps to installing a ferrule. I'll describe them in sequence. It's twist, tap, force, and then drive. The installation of a ferrule begins by twisting the ferrule over the shaft tip by hand with the small end of the ferrule first. At this point, the, the shaft, sh or shaft tip should already be abraded approximately half the length of the ferrule. It may also be helpful if you uh, dab a little epoxy on the shaft tip in order to lubricate it, and this is going to assist in twisting and sliding the ferrule into place. Plus, it'll also serve to secure it after the epoxy fully cures. In the case of a taper tip shaft, this is a very simple procedure since the inside diameter of the ferrule is always larger than the tip end of the shaft. And when working with the uh, taper tip iron shaft, the ferrule is going to glide at least three quarters of an inch without any resistance, assuming that you have a ferrule long enough. And once the ferrule reaches this point, the club head can be used to push the ferrule into its final position. This is as simple as starting out by placing the shaft tip into the club's hosel, then lightly tapping the butt end of the club on the floor. You want to make sure that you're holding the head with one hand and with your other hand about a foot down on the shaft. This is what's going to uh, force or drive the ferrule up the shaft. And when the shaft bottoms out in the hosel, it'll be um, in the proper place. You should also be able to hear a difference in the sound once the shaft bottoms out, more like a muted tone. Now you want to be careful not to drive the ferrule all the way on if you're going to be using tip pins for swing weighting. Otherwise you're going to end up driving the, the uh, ferrule up too far. Installing ferrules onto parallel tip shafts requires a little bit more work. Because the parallel tip shaft often has one constant diameter for an extended length, the ferrule is going to be more difficult to start over the tip and then push it up the shaft. And to allow the insertion of the shaft in the ferrule installation tool, the ferrule should at least be flush or maybe even a quarter inch of the shaft protruding out of the bottom of the ferrule before the ferrule installation. Generally, the, the metal uh, wood ferrules will slide on the shaft easier than the parallel tip ferrules. It's not as much force will be required when installing those. To help allow the ferrules to slide easier, you might even try soaking them in hot water to help soften them and make them more potentially easier to install. If the ferrule doesn't twist on easily, you can place the, uh, the butt of the shaft on the floor, and then using a rubber mallet, you can tap the ferrule so that the shaft uh, penetrates through the large end of the, the ferrule. In some cases, the ferrule may have to be struck fairly hard with your rubber mallet, so be sure to check the uh, ferrule's alignment on the shaft after each blow. If the, the ferrule isn't straight with respect to the shaft, the ferrule will be damaged and need to be replaced. Plus, be extra, extra careful with any ferrule with uh, those trim rings because those can break off uh, pretty easily. Now, to force the ferrule further up, 
you could do this the easy way with, an, uh, with a ferrule installation tool. And these are available from component suppliers like the ferrule block that Harico sells, which is shown on the bottom left of this slide. It pushes the uh, ferrule up three quarters of an inch every time. And it also serves double duty by measuring common shaft and grip diameters, and it's mainstay on my workbench. There's some club makers out there who elect to use their own homemade installation tool made from a small block of hardwood with a 3 8 inch hole drilled into it. And others just might use the head to dry the ferrule up. But I caution those because if you use the head to dry the ferrule on, it could cause injury to yourself or even the club head if it were to slip. Okay. So to use our ferrule block, the beauty is that the ferrule doesn't necessarily have to be on the shaft with any of the shaft protruding from the large end. And this could be a huge time saver. With the, the ferrule just started on the shaft, you want to push the large end of the ferrule over the hole. Then simply push down on the shaft so that it goes through the hole, sliding the shaft up with very little force. The ferrule installation tool is not going to position the ferrule precisely at its final point, but it does make installation much easier. You'll st still need to uh, take the club head and slide the shaft into it and tap it on the floor to drive the ferrule in its final location or when the shaft, or shaft bottoms out to the, the bottom of the bore. And again, to do this, you just grab the head with one hand and hold the shaft about one foot down from the top of the hosel, like pictured. And holding the shaft tightly on the, the driver, just drive the, the butt of the shaft against the floor, or a metal plate if you want to save your, uh, your floor from uh, nicks and dings. And you want to continue this process until you can feel the, the shaft bottom out in the hosel. Again, you're going to hear a, a, a difference in the sound it makes, and that'll give you the clue that you've hit the bottom of the bore. However, if you're swing weighting the club with tip pins, these will need to be installed first before driving the ferrule into the final position. The, the lips of those pins are approximately an eighth inch thick, and failure to remember to allow for that uh, dimension, the tip pin is going to create a gap when you put the, uh, the, the uh, club onto the shaft. And you want to be very careful with ferrule setting tools uh, that are designed to put the ferrule in the exact location. And then in my honest opinion, it's not necessarily and even a waste of money. Even with all those careful pre-calculations and calibrations of the ferrule setting tools, it can all go to waste when you discover that the club head's board or bore was not measured accurately, or the bore of the seven iron was slightly shorter than it was on the eight iron leaving an unsightly gap between the ferrule and the hosel. Setting the, the ferrule on three quarters of an inch, like our ferrule block does, it's all that's necessary, and the head can do the rest. Now, when installing a reducer or a specialty ferrule, the trick is to install it and the shaft at the same time rather than in steps. The reason being is inevitably you're going to get the epoxy somewhere it shouldn't, and inhibit the shaft from going in all the way into the ferrule or into the head. In some cases, these types of ferrules may not even fit your ferrule installation tool, and you'll have to use one of the other methods to position it on the shaft. Now, after you install the ferrule, you want to carefully inspect that there is no gaps between the, the, the base of the ferrule and the top of the head. Sometimes with woods and hybrids, you can drive the ferrule too far up because the shaft tip compresses the little plastic stop in the bottom of the hovel. Now for tiny gaps, some club makers will just simply grind the shaft tip using their belt sander so that the ferrule comes to rest against the hosel. You have to make sure not to take too much off, otherwise the club's going to become noticeably shorter and reduce the effective surface area for your epoxy. But there's other options. In one case, you can either have to 
remove the, the current ferrule and install a new one, or you may be able to pull the current one down into place. And to do this, you simply use like a, a vinyl shaft clamp and device and pull on the butt end of the shaft to hopefully move the ferrule down a bit into the proper position. On the right is a, a picture of an aluminum shaft clamp. And these can also be used to position uh, or reposition the ferrule. What you, what you do is find the, the correct hole and then position it above the ferrule and then just lightly tap it with a rubber mallet to lower the ferrule to the, uh, uh, to the hosel. But you need to be cautious uh, using this method not to mar the shaft, especially when you're working with a graphite shaft. So I usually say it's a wise practice to place a piece of masking tape on the shaft just above the ferrule uh, as a precautionary measure. And secondly, you want to make sure not to flare out the very top of the ferrule because the aluminum shaft clamp is going to be harder than the plastic. Now one day, I had my graphite shaft puller in my vise, and I needed to uh, move a ferrule that had crept up. Well, it dawned on me that the same force used to push the head off a graphite shaft may be able to push the ferrule down. So I set the hosel stop so it was barely larger than the shaft and it wouldn't mar the bottom of the ferrule. Once the shaft was clamped, it took very little effort to push the ferrule back down using the gear mechanism. So that's a little quick tip for you. At this time, I'd like to mention the use of adapter sleeves. You might find these in clubs like the Dynacraft Profit ICT series, the TaylorMade R9 or R11, the Nike Dymo, the Callaway IMX, let's see, the, the title is SureFit in the 910 series, to name just a few. While these are not ferrules per se, they are a separate piece or pieces from the head. Now once the USGA recently relaxed the adjustability rule, this opened up a new chapter in club head design and custom fitting. They allowed the shaft to be epoxied within a receiver or an adapter. And after the epoxy is set, the adapter could be then slid into the head and then affixed with a screw or some other means that's not going to rely on a uh, uh, rely on epoxy. That way, if the golfer wanted to change out the shaft, they could. In some cases, like our patent-pending Dynacraft Profit ICT adapter, it allows for variations in the face angle and lie of the club because the, the hosel is actually bored in an off angle. It's not drilled straight through. So it's important that you pre-align the adapter um, in the head in the position you'd like prior to installing the shaft and grip, if at all possible. Now, these adapters are usually milled out of aluminum and maybe anodized black to make it appear like they're a ferrule. And depending upon the adapter, you may need to use a separate ferrule along with it, like the, the TaylorMade R9 and R11 sleeve shown on the left of this slide. Now, Hariko sells a replacement sleeve for these, uh, the, the R9 and R11, so you can use different 335 shafts. On the right is a picture of Hariko's own ICT adapter. Originally, it was designed for a ferrule to be placed above the adapter, but I found it looked fine without one, as the adapter sleeve kind of looks like a ferrule, and it's got a little bit of a bevel to it at the top. But if you decide to add a ferrule, it's best to secure those into the, these adapters into the head first, and then use the steps that I previously mentioned. Lastly, I want to cover one other type of ferrule referred to as a clock ferrule. These are specialty adapters that go into select OEM clubs from Callaway, Ping, and TaylorMade. The purpose is to change the way the shaft exits the hosel to create different loft or lie angles. Now, how these work is the clock ferrule is bored in an off angle, much like some of the adapter sleeves I just mentioned. And by rotating the ferrule in the various position, it can alter the lie or face angle as much as two degrees one way or another. 
it's a way of taking a driver that may be too closed or too open for, for a particular uh, golfer, and with their proper adjustments, allow that person to hit the ball straighter. Uh, directions will come with these adapter ferrules, which we do sell. So make sure to use the flap or the alignment line marked on these unique ferrules to alter the lie and effective lock via the, the face angle. And these will only work with 335 shafts rather than the stock 350 shaft that came with the head. You also might find it helpful to have a specification gauge as a way to double check the angles prior to epoxying in place. This is why I consider this to be more of an advanced club making skill and I reserve mentioning these last. Well that's the end of our webinar today. Now let's turn this back over to Rob and we can answer any questions you may have in the time remaining. Great, excellent presentation, Jeff. Thank you so much. All right, folks, you can start typing your questions into the question box on your dashboard there, and we'll get to them as they come in. Taped, uh, we're taping this webinar, and it will be on youtube.com slash golf, as you see, and on our blog at blog.hericogolf.com, and I'll get those up in about one hour. <clears throat> All right, guys, don't have any questions. We'll wait just a few more moments here. Maybe it's a quiet group. Jeff did a pretty thorough job of uh, explaining everything, so maybe there's no questions today. Okay, first one comes from Kermit. What techniques do you recommend for installing the Profit ICT connector? Um, the, just the adapter? Um, the, the best thing to do is um, if, if you notice that the adapter is going to have a white alignment dot, you want to put that in the position that you think that you're going to hit best, slide it into the uh, head, and then secure the uh, take the screw and secure it in place until it's fully tightened. And then you can just epoxy the uh, uh, club like you normally would. And uh, again, the, the ferrule is optional on this, this count, but if you, if you do want to put the ferrule on, just go through the uh, steps um, uh, I showed earlier. Okay. Al asks, what are your thoughts on using epoxy to help slide the ferrule on the shaft? It's an excellent uh, idea because uh, it's going to act as a lubricant, and also it, some is going to eventually get under the, the ferrule and then once it cures, it's it's not going to have any chance of sliding up and down the shaft. Okay, Kermit follows up on the uh, ICT question. I find that unless you use a fast-setting epoxy, there is a good chance there will be epoxy le leaking out when you install it. Maybe he's just commenting on that. Not, not really a question. Yeah, yeah maybe one of the older ones where um, the... Uh, there should be a plastic stop at the bottom of the um, ICT adapter to stop the epoxy from flowing. If not, you can always take a uh, um, like a steel shaft for a, an iron and take like a manila folder and 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 cut like a a, a round um, plug, and that should fit right down inside and and stop those from leaking. Great. Any more questions, guys? Okay, question from Mike. I thread my ferrules internally and use epoxy to eliminate ferrule creep. What do you think of this practice? If it's work, if it's some extra work, I'm sure. But uh, sometimes the creeping is is caused by stuff that uh, who knows what happens. I mean, I've seen when using lead tip pens and so forth, if you don't get all the air out, um, it might push it up, and and even what you're doing, it may still uh, occur. But if, hey, if it if it's working, um, go for it. Great. Gary asked to get a proper insider diameter sizing. You can also get a seven a number seven reamer to enlarge for an iron ferrule. For a wood ferrule, take the same reamer to a machine shop and have it ground to point three thirty five. Just giving a comment there. Thank you, Gary. 
All right, any other questions, guys? We'll wrap it up. If not, wait a few more moments here. Any other comments, Jeff? Nope, that should take care of it. Just hope everybody's uh, in the air conditioning right now. Very hot here in Ohio. Thanks, guys. We're going to wrap this up, and we really appreciate it. We'll be talking to you next August, or in August for our next webinar. Thanks again, and have a great weekend.